Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Bulletproof Faith. We are so glad that you've joined us. Stand by as we have an exciting program getting into God's Word, answering questions you've always wanted answers to. I know you got the soul thing under control. My soul is untouchable because you've already won me. My victory is not in this flesh and bone. It's in the cross and I know nobody's taking it from me. I got my armor now, no fear, no doubt can't shoot me down. Yeah, I got my armor now, no fear, no doubt gonna shoot me down, 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 down. down. So welcome back. We are so excited that you've joined us this evening for this week's edition of Bulletproof Faith. My name is Karen. I'm here with Dimitri. We're broadcasting to you from Cape Town in South Africa. And we want to say thank you so much to Matt for that epic, epic introduction that he's put together, as well as Citizen Way, who've allowed us to use their song as our signature for Bulletproof Faith from South Africa. Dimitri, I need to ask you a question. The name of the show, Bulletproof Faith, just help me out here a little bit. What exactly does it mean and why did you choose that name? Well, Karin, you know the armor of God that is spoken about in Ephesians chapter 6. Yes. Put on the full armor of God, the shield of... Faith. Yes, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, and all of that, that we might protect ourselves from the fiery darts of the wicked one. And um, so if you think about it with the military, they always got to make sure whether it's their aircraft or their tanks, ships, whatever it may be, even the personnel equipment, that it's bulletproof. Absolutely. And um, And so we need to have a bulletproof faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course... We know this show is about real people getting real answers straight out of God's, God's word. word, the Bible. Amen. So That's awesome. So I hope you guys got that. And you know what? When I was thinking and we were preparing about tonight's show, one of the verses in Corinthians where Paul says that you need to be ready to have an answer for those who boast against the gospel. And that's why we're here this evening giving you answers from God's Word for the questions that you guys have sent in. So if you've just joined us, you're welcome to go into the live chat, post in your questions. We'll get to them next week or as soon as we can. We're loving the amount of questions that's coming in, and we're so excited. And let's, Dimitri, let's get straight into the Word. And our first question is classic because it actually comes from our little guy. We have four kids. Micah is our youngest. And every week he's been asking Dimitri the same question. And I'm certain it's a question that many of you have asked. So, Shiloh, let's put it up on the screen and let's see our first question for tonight. Do dogs go to heaven when they die? Okay, Dimitri, where do dogs go when they die? Answer carefully, hey? You know, they always put the toughest questions <laughs> right up at the front. I'm sorry. And, um, you know, I find that the, the questions that children ask are often the toughest. And um, But yet... You know, our little boy, Mikey, he's, we, we've got a dog, little Boston Terrier, Aki, that Mikey loves to bits. And the two of them are like just the terrible twins. They get up to mischief together. And um, kind of reminds me when I was a boy, because I can remember asking the exact same question. Yeah. Um, I, I had a little fox terrier, and uh, his name was Scampy. It was the... the best dog a boy could have and um, he was trained so well in fact when I used to walk to school he would walk with me go to the front gate of the school and then two o'clock in the afternoon he would come back and be waiting so when I got out of school he was Aww. waiting at the gate so and he would walk back and of course the time came when he got very sick and Scampy died Aww, and Dimitri, I can remember so asking my dad the same question Dad, will Scampy be in heaven? <laughs> and, and, and so here's our boy Micah asking the same question. And, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of sad to answer that and say, no, there are no dogs in heaven. 
Answer but no, answer you know, the scripture, and we've got to be true where the scripture is true. And there, there are no scripture verses that give any hint whatsoever that there are dogs in heaven or cats in heaven or any other kind of animal species. Um, and, and we know Jesus said that, that he is the way to the Father and, and no one comes except through him. And Jesus came to redeem men. And, and, and the whole principle of heaven and salvation is coming in by faith. And so, of course, an animal can't do that. Yeah. But I want to give a few more scriptures, especially to you dads and moms who are watching. And you know you're going to get this question asked. I want to give you some scripture. And also, there, I, I, I think there's some, some, something actually encouraging in this. I, I think this, this question really opens up mm. to... One of the great doctrines of Christ coming into the world. So the first scripture is Ecclesiastes 3.21. Ecclesiastes 3.21. And it says that the spirit of man goes upwards, but the spirit of the animal goes downwards into the ground. Um, and so that's making a distinction between an animal yeah. and a human. Okay. So two different kinds of spirit. Um, but of course, that's not to say that animals aren't important to God. Yeah. Uh, and we've got to realize that because God created the animals. He made them wonderful. And even the smallest little creatures, God put so much intelligence, so much wisdom, so much marvelous uh, you know, abilities. Um, and so you, you look at that little tiny hummingbird, um, you look at a giant elephant, its trunk and all those abilities. Just think God created all those. Now, Jesus, when he spoke in Luke, he said in Luke 12, verse 6, he said, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And he says, Not one of them is forgotten by God. No. Okay? So you can see animals have a special place yes. in the heart of God. Also, um, when God explained to Jonah why he didn't destroy Nineveh, he said, Because there's much livestock there. Sure. So not only about the people, 120,000 young people don't know their hand, right hand from the left, but also much livestock. Yeah. God cares about the animals. But I want to read to you a portion of scripture from Romans 8 that just absolutely enlightens us. And um, Corin, I want you, can you look up another scripture? In fact, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6 to 9, and I'll read you the scripture because this really helps us to understand the future. And Paul writes in Romans 8, he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation it's talking of all the animal kingdom waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. In other words, for the day when, when all the followers of Jesus are going to be resurrected and come into their new bodies. And he says in verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation, now listen to this, the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And um, this is amazing. And he says, even right now, creation is groaning and longing for that moment. So if you think right at the beginning, Adam, through his sin, causes the fall of all creation. So death spreads even into the animal kingdom yeah. through Adam. But now Jesus comes and he brings life. And it says, not only to us, to bring us resurrection, but to deliver the whole universe yeah. from that bondage, from that decay. And so it's creation itself will be delivered. Yeah. Um, Corin, read this verse, and this is just to give us a bit of a forward picture. When the Lord comes and he creates this new heaven and new earth, how will animals relate to each other? I'm so glad you read out this verse. I've been thinking of it. And it's Isaiah chapter um, 11, verses 6 to 9, if you're taking notes. And it says, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. So boys and girls, if you're listening with us, okay, try to remember all the animals that Isaiah is listing here. All right. The wolf also will dwell with the lamb. 
the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion with the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Micah, are you listening? Joshua? The cow and the bear shall graze, the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the wean child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow, boys and girls, that's a lot of animals mentioned there. Well, yes, and, and you can see the, the beautiful way that when we're in the new heavens and the new earth, the way that animals are going to relate to one another. Um, so this is something exciting that, yes, there will be animals in God's new kingdom that he is setting up. And, um, and it's, it's you, you know, if we think about it just logically, when we read in the end of Revelation, we read of people, we read of angels, we read of, of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and of course we read of uh, a river, we read of trees. And fruit. Lord. And of course, so yes, yeah, so it's not far-fetched to yeah. think that, yes, the Lord, you know, the new heavens and earth won't be less yeah. than what we currently have. Yeah. So I look forward to animals. Absolutely. <laughs> and in the meantime, boys and girls, look after your animals so well and love them because the Bible says God created all things for our pleasure. And he also says we must look after them very well. So you must look after the pets that you've been given. Very good question. Very much. Thank you. So we're going to go to our next one this evening. And um, it's from Juanita. And let's listen to her question. My question would be um, a Bible question. What is the preferred book in the Bible to study after being born again, after salvation? Juanita, thank you so much for sending that question. Such a good one. And we're so glad because we know that there are many new believers, those looking into the faith who are watching. Dimitri, what is the preferred book of the Bible to study after being born again? Yeah, well, Corin, what was the first book of the Bible that really opened you up to the Lord and helped you to understand so much of the basics of salvation? Do you remember? Well, I, I think there were obviously there's so many, but I remember the books that really, as a young believer, just I mean, the book of Romans, really explaining and understanding sin and the way of grace. But I think even going book that before that, I, th I would say the book of James and Philippians. But James, I remember as a child, really getting so caught up and trying to understand um, a lot of that um, as well. So, yeah. Yeah, funny. I thought you'd say Ecclesiastes, but <laughs> it's my wife. <laughs> but, you know, Juanita, when uh, someone becomes a believer, they essentially they are baby. And Paul, when he spoke in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and he said to the church, he said, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. So as you know, a baby doesn't have teeth. And so everything that a baby eats or consumes has to be very highly processed or mother's milk. And the same is true spiritually speaking. Um, we've got at New Life, we've got, we call it the foundations course, which deals with salvation, assurance, prayer, um, trials, temptations, um, reading scripture, all those kind of things, which is really great. But your question, you are specifically what book of the Bible? And I had to really scratch my head and think about this because when you think of a, a baby Christian, what is the need? What are the needs specifically of a a tot in the Lord. And um, that would be, firstly, I would think assurance of salvation. So it would have to be a book that would deal with being sure that you are saved. Yeah. Uh, secondly, how to walk the Christian walk, importance of love, understanding the love of God, um, how to, how to um, conduct, how to live in the world, what to watch out for in the world, and to understand the importance of faith, and your relationship with Jesus, that you've got someone who's at the right hand of the Father, who um, is there to pray for you, to be your support, your advocate. And, um, you know, when I think of all of that, I think of one book that really brings every one of those into play. And it's, it's not too long either. And that is the book of First John, the epistle. Yeah. So in other words, 
uh, not the Gospel of John, but First John right towards the end of the Bible, five chapters, and it covers all those areas. Um, what I would also recommend is, of course, reading the Gospel of Mark. I know a lot of people say the Gospel of John, but I, I prefer Mark. Yeah. It, it's, it's just it's shorter. It's, it's got a good mix of the miracles of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, and um, also brings the gospel in and it's a lot more faster paced and it's easier to read and so I, I would settle between those two books first john and um and and so of course the book of mark and then james so <laughs> I think when if you're going to go through First John, I think I love, look out for how many times John uses the word love, like over and over. So keep a pen and look for those words that he repeats. Are there any other key words perhaps as we need to go through she can look out for? The, you, you know the other one, and, and this is just unique. <laughs> Hold on, there's 66 no, books. No, about, about First John is that John so often addresses it little children. Yeah. So I think it's yeah. absolutely, I think that's the book. Amen. Okay. So we need to, if you need any further advice, whatever, please feel free to email us, contact us off newlifetou.com. And for those of you as well, the Foundations of Faith, it's a free Bible study course. You can get it off our website again, newlifetou.com. Click on there and we will make sure that you get it. A great, as it says, Foundations in Faith. And we will really able to any way we can assist you, please get in touch with us. So thank you so much for that question. May the Lord bless you as you feed on God's word. So let's go straight into our next video. Hi, family. My question here today is what happens when we die? Do the good and bad souls wait somewhere or do they separate awaiting judgment day? Mona, thank you so much for sending in that video. Such an interesting and very good question. Now, many people are wondering what happens when we die? Do the good and bad souls wait somewhere or do they are they separate awaiting Judgment Day? Yeah, Mona Lisa, I'm sure a lot of people have that question and it's, it's one that we need to answer conclusively through the Word of God. So there's no, um, I think, maybe, or this is what I believe. Yeah. Um, we've got to be absolutely sure what God's word says. Now, the whole doctrine, we call it of the afterlife. After a person dies, man, woman, boy, girl, what happens to them? Mm -hmm. um, and the scripture deals with it right from the beginning, from the book of Genesis, and in fact, all the way through the book of Revelation, every scripture in between. There's so many scriptures that speak of it, even in the Psalms and other passages. But I like in Genesis chapter 35, verse 29, where it speaks of Isaac dying. And it says that as he reached that old age, it says, Isaac breathed his last and he died. And it says he, would, he was gathered together to his people and his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. So it deals with um, the, the fact of him breathing his last, his heart stopping, yeah. him dying, and then it doesn't say he was buried and then something happened. It says in between his death and when he was buried, it says he was gathered up to his people. And so we take it right at the moment of death. Yeah. When he starts living, he was gathered. I love that word. He was yeah. gathered to his people. It's really the idea of angels taking and escorting his soul up into heaven, where, of course, his father Abram was and every other believer yeah. at that time. Um, so being gathered to your people. Um, so um, we're going to look. I want to look at that quickly. What about the unsaved? What about the person who does not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, what, who is not saved. Um, it's answered in Luke chapter 16. We've got the account of the rich man and Lazarus. And it says in Luke 16, those of you who got your Bibles, you want to quickly flip there, Luke 16 verse 19. And it says, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple, glorious, clothes and fine linen and he fed sumptuously in other words he ate very well every day and it says but there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was full of sores who was laid at his gate 
desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And so it was that the beggar died and was carried. Now this word, like Isaac gathered to his people, he was carried by the angels to Abram's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abram afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And uh, he cries out. So a lot of people talk of this as the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Yeah. There's never any word in the scripture here that says it's a parable. And I don't believe it was a parable. I believe it was a real life event that in the days of Jesus, there was a beggar named Lazarus and there was a wealthy man. And, um, you, you know, there's no parable of scripture where a name is mentioned. Lazarus, or where it's spoken of, Abraham. Um, so we understand that this was probably a real yeah. person, Lazarus, and, and Abram. And he cried out, the rich man, and said, Father Abram, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. And Abram said, Son, remember, in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus his evil things, and now he is comforted and you are tormented. And then he goes on, Abram goes on to say, And besides this, between us there is this great gulf fixed, and no one can pass from this side to that side or from there to here. And Mona Lisa, what that makes very clear is that after death, our souls are taken up into heaven. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. Yeah. Absent from the body. In fact, it even describes your body like a tent. And it says when you leave your tent as a believer, you go to be with the Lord. You're there with Him. And then you wait for the day of resurrection when all believers, dead and alive, will be resurrected, raised up to that's First Thessalonians 4. But in that time period, immediately at death, the righteous and the unrighteous are separated like Lazarus. Some will go to heaven to wait for resurrection and the unbeliever will be cast in. The Bible says Hades, the place of suffering, and his future will be the lake of fire and the destruction, you know, with Satan, etc., etc. So um, I hope that answers your question. Sure. Dimitri, it's such an important one for us as believers to know because it, I think it takes away the fear of death because death isn't the unknown, but to know the moment we breathe our last, we open our eyes to, to be with Jesus. So it gives that real sense of excitement that removes any fear or uncertainty. But then also, I, I know I've heard as well, a lot of unbelievers think, well, you know, I'll die and then there's a place where I get to hang around in purgatory for a while. And while I'm there, I'll pay for my sins and then I'll get to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. And so what you've shared is really taken any foundation out of that idea or theory as having no biblical authority because it's it's death and then it's eternity there's no waiting room in between and that's really important um, for any viewers who are watching who aren't saved to realize there, there's no second pass after death death is final and whether before that we need to have received Christ and made a choice to follow him after we've passed. There's no, there's no waiting room where you can deal your cards to see if you, you get to choose heaven or hell. And so we urge you, if any of you are watching and haven't made that decision for Christ, we, contact us. There's plenty of information available because we don't want you to miss out on eternity with the Lord Jesus. So Mona, thank you so much for us. I um, really appreciate it. Let's listen to our next question coming from Liesl, New Life Milneton lovely to have you send that in and we'll carry on with the program if jesus was a jew the girls always wanted to know how come we not jewish liesel thank you so much for that question if jesus was a jew shouldn't we be jewish yeah uh, liesel if i understood you correctly i'm um, uh, meaning that we should adopt because jesus was jewish that we should also uh adopt jewish uh, customs, beliefs, that kind of thing. Um, the answer to that has to do with, there's a word in the New Testament that we often read, and it's the word uh, proselytes. 
And uh, you see it in the book of Acts. We read of uh, a man named Cornelius who was a proselyte. He was, he was a Roman, but uh, had, had come to believe and accept the beliefs of the Jews. And, and, and so he had proselytized, come into that. Um, and, uh, of course, in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, we read about um, those who, when on the day of Pentecost, that there were Jews from every place that were gathered in Jerusalem, but it also speaks of proselytes who had come there. Non-Jews, but they believed in Judaism and ac accepted that. So um, th the answer to that question is no, as Christians, the scripture very clearly tells us we're not to become proselytes. In fact, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and he said, you go and you travel land and see to make one proselyte. That's what he was talking about. And Jesus never said, like we should do it. He said, go into the world and make disciples yeah. of mine. Don't go make proselytes, make disciples. Um, and there, there's, there's a lot of other scripture. I think um, today um, I, I see it, it is a bit of an alarming uh, occurrence that we do see among some Christians today that they, 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 when they start growing spiritually and then they become aware of the Old Testament and the feasts and um, Sabbath and all that and, and they sometimes get sucked into this whole kind of thing of I must be like a Jew now and I must start keeping the feasts and celebrating Yom Kippur and all the different Passover and um, then I must start keeping the Sabbath and then they stop referring to God as God as Yahweh and all that um, it, it's, it's to realize that that's not what Jesus desires of us. I'll give you three scriptures to help you to understand that, to be absolutely sure of it. Um, the first is and going right back when um, in Acts chapter 15, we've got the first council meeting. What was it about? When the apostles came together in Jerusalem and the elders and they had a big, there was a big discussion that went on. What was it about? It was about Jewish teachers who were going around telling Gentiles that they had to proselytize, that they had to become part of the Jewish faith. And the conclusion, if you read in Acts chapter 15, the conclusion of that is no, let the Gentiles be Gentiles. As long as they have accepted Christ and are saved, they stay Gentiles. They don't have to adopt the Jewish culture. The next scripture is in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17 to 24. And it says, let each man remain in the state in which he was called. So when you got saved, if you was a Gentile, stay a Gentile. If you was a slave, stay a slave. If you was free, stay free. Um, if you were circumcised, stay circumcised. If you was uncircumcised, meaning a Gentile, let him stay uncircumcised. Yeah. So I answered very clearly. And um, another scripture, well, you could look at the book of Galatians where the false teachers were coming in telling them they had to proselytize and become Jews. And Paul says, no, he says, I labored, I travailed for you. Um, stay what you are. In other words, keep living by faith, trusting in the Holy Spirit. And so don't think all those outward things are going to make you more holy or more righteous. Um, in the book of Revelation, when we look in chapter 7, we see a scene in heaven. And um, it, it's people of all, and it says tribes and tongues and peoples and nations that are all gathered together in one, dressed in white with palm branches. Yeah. And so this is the idea that it's all nations that come together in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 1.16, that the gospel is for the Jew and also for the Gentile. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, we don't need to become Jews in order to be saved and get to Jesus. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Liesl, thank you so much for sending that question in. And certainly a lot of beauty in the symbolism that the Old Testament brings to all those feasts. But just that it's, it was a shadow of, of and Jesus being the fulfillment, all that. And so I'd much rather hug you than hug your shadow. And so we'd much rather just embracing all that Christ has given to us mm -hmm. than, than chasing shadows. And so thank you so much for that. We're going to go into our next question, which is a text coming from Peter, and it's going to be up on the screen in a few moments. Peter, thank you for sending that in. How can I stay focused? Okay, I think this this question, so many viewers um, listen up, I think in the, the 
time and the culture we're in with this pandemic the world is facing, how can I stay focused, bombarded with what's happening in the world, with what's happening obviously in the news, social media, Although God is merciful, I'm feeling very afraid. And Peter, thank you for sending in that question. I know that you're not the only one feeling that fear. Um, we see that all around us. Dimitri, how can you comfort um, our viewers, our listeners this evening, for those who are afraid in these uncertain times? Um, you, you know, Peter, it's, it's amazing because this year, we almost noticed, like as we turned the decade, uh, it was almost like everything just broke loose. And um, I totally hear what you're saying and the anxiety. I think many uh, people, whether believers or non-believers, are feeling this. And we need to know at this time that, yes, there are these storms that are raging, a raging of the Gentiles. We can see all this happening. But how do we? What do we do? And um, it really reminds me so much of um, our own um, the, the, you, you know, in, um, we talk of the storms of life that come in and that blow and the gales that, I mean, here in the Cape, you know, being so far down south, we feel it. But, um, you know, if you were to get on a, a boat, a yacht or whatever, and you were to travel and keep going south from Cape Town, and uh, you were to travel for about 350, 360 nautical miles, and you keep going down, you would get into this zone that's known as the Roaring Forties, oh. where uh, the wind blows particularly hard, where there's storms. And um, what happens is the, those um, warm winds from the equator move downwards, and then the cold Antarctic winds move up and there's this convergence and of course it's just open Atlantic Ocean and so there's there's no land masses to stop the wind blowing and so you get these fierce gales and um, the the um, roaring 40s now if you keep going you keep going down okay you go from the roaring 40s to the furious 50s oh, no. it gets even worse and then from the Furious 50s, you get into the screaming 60s, where you're getting closer and closer, you're going down, you're still going down, down, down. And there, you can encounter like 10 meter high waves. And um, a lot of ships <laughs> kind of had bad experiences there. But, you know, the, the more you go down and down and down, it's like the more furious the storms become. Yeah. And this is true as the world, as we are winding down, as things are getting closer to the end of the age, we're seeing the the waves that are, you know, it's going five meters, eight meters, 10 meters, it's getting more and more intense. And um, we've got to realize that even in that space, there are actually yachts and their boats that intentionally choose the roaring 40s. Um, and, and so, you know, it's a real fast way to get to Australia, you know. <laughs> Um, you know, so you just get into it and, and it pushes you along. And I think that's for us is to realize, yes, it, it, it's terrible times, but at the same time, we're going close and close and faster and faster towards the, the end of all things. And um, we've got to realize that these storms, well, if you if, if you um, not in Christ, it's terrifying. If you are in Christ, just remember when Jesus was in the boat with his disciples and the, the storms were so furious and they go, don't you care? We are perishing, <laughs> you know, and he gets up and he rebukes the wind and the waves. And, you know, I love the, when that chapter ends of, of Mark and the next chapter begins and it says, and then when they'd come to the other side, yeah. they got off the boat. And, and for me, those verses so minister to my spirit because I know I'm going to come through on the other side. Yeah. I know I'm going to come through on the other side of Corona. I know I'm going to come through the other side of this economic crash. I know I'm going to come across on the other side of every other kind of woe, every other persecution, every other tsunami, whatever else is going to come upon this world. We will come onto the other side because Jesus is in the boat with us. And I, I want to encourage you, brother, with that. And all of you, if you're becoming anxious about what's going on or maybe I'll lose my job, maybe this will happen, just realize they came onto the other side. And they got out the boat and they walked. And God will see us through all these things. So let's just have faith in him. He's so, so gracious and, and always faithful in the storm. Yeah. Amen. Amen.
It's just a verse I want to share with our viewers as we close this evening's Bulletproof Faith. And it's from Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. And it was actually the scripture we, did, Micah and Chloe and I were reading in our devotions this morning. And the Lord says to you, Peter, this is for you and everyone watching. He says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Mm. That's Isaiah 41.10. I encourage you, write it down. Put it as your screensaver. Put it on your fridge. Put it on your mirror. Put it on your pillow. Because the Lord is making some incredible promises there. And he says he will with you. He will not leave you. And he will not forsake you. Put your hope in the Lord. Not in man. Not in science. Not in economics. But put your hope in the Lord. So bless you so much. We'll be praying for that. So Dimitri, we've come to a close of this evening's Bulletproof Faith. I know you're going to close off in prayer for us. Viewers, it's been amazing sharing this evening with you. We want you to chat in the live chat below. Send in your questions. Contact us off newlifetoyou.com. And we're super excited. Join us again tomorrow evening for the next episode of Bulletproof Faith. Dimitri, please close us in prayer. Viewers, forward this to a friend. Use it as a way of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are so excited that you would keep going stronger in your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Won't you pray with us? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I want to pray uh, this evening for every person watching tonight, wherever they are in the city, wherever they are in the country or even the world. We want to thank you, Lord. And you said that let none of these things move us. And uh, we want to pray, Father, tonight, we want to ask of you for a strengthening of our faith. We want to pray to you, Lord, that in these last days that we are living in, that our eyes would be fixed on you, Lord Jesus. And I pray a blessing upon every person tonight, everyone watching, everyone part of this, Lord. And uh, I thank you for every person one every question that has been given lord and we want to pray that you would use tonight to cement to solidify their faith and trust in you we pray this in jesus name be with each one throughout this uh, next day and the rest of this week in your name amen amen, amen. have a blessed week we'll see you tomorrow night amen.